Morning, everybody. Welcome back to Yechazkel. Uh, we're picking up here in chapter 16, Parag Ted Zion, and we're going to start from Pasuk Ted Vav, that's verse 15. So that's 16, 15 in Yechazkel. It's a very, very beautiful chapter, although a very graphic one. Just to give you um, a bit of a recap of what we talked about last time, this chapter, the Navi, portrays Jewish history through the metaphor of the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, as a baby that has been rejected by her parents, and then this benevolent father slash husband figure, I would say, takes the baby and takes care of her and raises her and she begins to flourish and she matures and then he adorns her with beautiful clothing, beautiful garments and jewelry and she becomes the most beautiful woman in the world and she rises to prominence and she becomes royalty and all the people in the rest of the world marvel at her greatness. And this is all seen as a parable for how Hashem took the Jewish people from very humble beginnings, likely referring to their beginning as a, a nation, of, or not even a nation, as a number of families who were enslaved in Egypt who had no identity and also no spiritual stature to speak of. They were lost. They had also um, sunk into the spiritual lows of Egypt. And Hashem slowly and gradually raises them out of Egypt and does miracles for them and reveals himself to them and brings them to the desert and gives them a few mitzvot. And then they get the Torah and then they get the Mishkan, and then they go into Eretz Israel, and they get the Mikdash, and they have a kingship, and they have prophecy. And that's Hashem slowly and gradually taking care of the Jewish people throughout history until they reach the pinnacle, likely at the time of Shlomo HaMelech, King David's son, when, who was a very prominent king, where the kingdom of Israel was well known throughout the world and they had the mikdash and they had financial success and political success and the um and the navi is saying that at that point all of that is due to Hashem's kindness and specifically also due to the Jewish people's faith and their loyalty to the way of Torah and mitzvot that's sort of what we talked about last time. And at the end of last time, of course, this is Yechezkel, at the beginning of Yechezkel, at least. So, you know, it's not going to be a happy ending. So, of course, when we reach that pinnacle, it all goes downhill from there. And again, um, and I would even say, if I were reading the rest of this chapter, if you thought last week the uh, Sukim we studied together were rated PG-13 or something like that, <laughs> This week it's rated R. Um, I don't know if you have any grandchildren there in the audience, but you might want to be wary um, because it really gets quite graphic today. And again, the Navi continues to portray now the downward spiral of the Jewish people throughout history, but through the this again, this metaphor of Hashem and or rather of the Again, husband slash father, I would say, who raises, who has raised this young woman, this young, beautiful woman, princess, only to see her totally reject the upbringing he tried to give her. So that's what we're going to read about today. I'm going to read, we're going to, I don't think we're going to, it has to be a huge parak. It's like over 60 psukim long. Um, I don't think I want to try to finish the whole thing today, but we're going to read the second half of this. And I'd like to, again, it, it, it gets a bit repetitive, but and it's very graphic, but I'd like to see 
what we can take from the Navi's description, Yechezkel's description of the downfall of the Jewish people. So we'll pick it up from Hasuk Tetva. It says, again, this is chapter 16, verse 15. You took confidence in your beauty. Batizni al We're going to see that word again and again today. Uh, not, not the word you want to see so frequently, to be honest. But that is to say you were a prostitute upon your name. You sold yourself in this awful, open, sexually suggestive way. I guess also makes you could say, despite your name or because of your name, because of your fortune, but tishpechi etaznu tayich al kol over. You poured out your prostitution upon all passers-by. Um... And the, the, the parable is, is pretty clear here. Again, it's graphic that you have this beautiful woman and everybody knows about her. And all of a sudden she's, again, unfortunately in today's day and age, we don't have to think too hard about what this actually looks like. We have this beautiful, well-known, prominent woman and she is displaying her beauty to the world in a suggestive, lustful way. Such that it's described as pouring out her prostitution to all who pass by, lo yehi. So we, we'll see this a few times. Here, lo yehi spelled with a vav. So that would mean it will be to him. So it would sound like whoever wanted you could have you. A tick Can I just yeah. ask a question just on that? So does that suggest on the level of the nimshal? that the Jews were drawn into a variety of forms of Avodah Zarah. Oh yeah, we'll see that, we'll see. Oh, yes, yes, it's right. gonna seem like that. So the big the big thing today, and I wanna read some of that and then discuss it with you, but for the most part, what there's gonna be a lot about prostitution today in various stages. <laughs> and it would seem that the nimshal, meaning the meaning of the parable, is that um, the sin of idolatry and the infidelity to God is portrayed as prostitution. You know, just give me one second. This, I have this WhatsApp app on my computer and a key. I don't even know. It's not even on. I don't even know how to turn it off. It's really <laughs> annoying. So I apologize for that. Um, might have just uninstall it, frankly. Anyways, let, let, let's read a little bit before we get bogged down, and then I think we can describe all of it here. Okay, that should be helpful. Ra Rabbi, just give me one second, Esther. I know, I know, you have a lot to say already, but we're just starting here. You got a lot of second to cover, so let's. I, I'd like to read a bunch of them, and then and then we can react to all of it. Because here we go. Okay, we're just getting started here. So batikhim abigadaya. You took from your clothing. You made these altars of beautiful clothing. Rashi says these, these, these mounds covered with speckled clothing of all different colors. So you took your clothing and used it to make these mounds with your clothing. And you... Practice prostitution upon them. Lo ba'ot v'lo yihiyeh. Best translated, that should have never come. That 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 lo ba'ot. Such things should never have happened. They weren't appropriate. But tikhi kleitz You took your utensils of glory. Mizahavi mikasbi ashenasati lav. The gold and silver that silver that I had given to you. You made male statues. Again, this is very graphic, but I think we do have to uh, translate the words. Mafarsham understand this to mean that these are, if you would imagine someone who is very lustful, this young woman, she makes an image of the male organ. 
-hmm. as if to uh, imagine, think about it, and to uh, use that for a very lustful end. And with these images, you again acted as a prostitute. But tikhi at big day rikmatik. And then you took your woven clothing, batikhasim, and you covered yourself or covered them. Basamniuk tartina satilith nayan, right? You covered the tsalme zahar with your clothing. And you took my Vishamniu Kitarti, you took my oil and my incense, and you put it in front of them. The bread that I have given to you, the fine flour, the oil, the honey that I have fed you. You put them, those foods, in front of these images, the reach nichoach as a an aroma. Vayehi, and so it was. The Umma Shemelokim. So says the word of God. You took your sons and daughters whom you had bore to me. You sacrificed them to them to eat. This was just a bit of your prostitution. You slaughtered my children. And you gave them as you passed them over for these idols. All your abominations and your prostitution. Among all of that, you do not remember the days of your youth. Yotech a Rome the area when you were naked without clothes, mit possessech with a mech rolling in your blood, hayit, you were. Vahayahi, achare kora atech, and behold, after all your evil, ay, ay, lach. Woe is to you, Neum Hashem Lokim, says the word of God. Batibni lach gav, you made for yourself a hill, a high place. You made a hill in every street. At the head of every road, you built your hill. You made your beauty abominable. Over, a very graphic image. You spread out your legs to all who passed by. You increased your prostitution. You allowed yourself, you sold yourself in prostitution to the Egyptians, your neighbors who grew flesh. And the basar here refers again to the male organ. Batirbi at taznu teich lachi seni. You increase, you multiply your prostitution to anger me. Vihine natiti adai alayich. I shall outstretch. I have outstretched my hand upon you. Vagrech ukeich. I lessened your what you received, your your sustenance. Vainich benefes and otayich benoplishdim. I put you among the souls of those who hated you, the daughters of the Plishtim, Hanichlamot Midarkech Zima, who were embarrassed of your lustful ways. That is, the Plishtim who you hate were embarrassed looking at your lustful behavior. Batizni al Ashur, and then you were unfaithful with the children of Ashur. Mildilti savotech, because you were not yet satisfied. Vatiznim vigamlo sava. You strayed with them and you were still not satisfied. Vatarbiataznutech el eretz kinaan kazdima. And you increased your prostitution beyond that of the land of Kinaan to Kostim, to the to Babylonia. Vigam bezot sava. 
and you were still not satisfied. Ma amulali bate. That was your nephew Leon. How how lowly, how shameful is your heart? Neumashemalokim says the Lord God. When you have done all of this, the actions of a woman who is a prostitute, Shalatet, who is ruled, and Rashi explains, who is ruled by her desires. As you built your height, or uh, at every road, and your hills you have built, or your mounds you have built every street. Okay, this is a this is a tricky one. You were not like the prostitute to praise herself with a reward. And so tricky, tricky, tricky phrase there. The way that the Mepharshim explain this is, and again, this is not my favorite topic to talk about, but um, prostitution, as understood, you know, in biblical times works, the way it works is that the woman who sells herself for this sort of labor gets paid. She receives some sort of reward, right? That's how, and, and so at least she looks at herself and she says, look what I got. But you, Israel, you haven't even done that. You haven't even received the reward that a prostitute re- gets in return for her services. This adulterous woman who, uh, you know, strays from under her husband, she takes these strange men. They give, these men, they give a reward. Rashi says, Nida is from the word mohar, like a nidunya is the sort of thing that, nidunya is actually what a woman receives from the husband as they, they get married, some sort of uh, dowry. So here it means not a, a medding dowry, but most prostitutes get a reward. But you, instead of getting a reward, you have given over your dowry to all those who you whom you have loved, meaning you're you're paying for this. But Tishahadi Otam, and you have bribed them, Lavo Elayah, to go upon you, Misaviv Bitazitayah, as they as you as as you surround yourself with your prostitution. You are the opposite of women with your prostitution. And and uh, you know there's never been such a such a lustful shameful prostitute after you. As you gave the reward, you didn't take it. It wasn't given to you, and it was the opposite. Then we'll just read two more psukim. zona. Therefore, you prostitute. Shimid var Hashem. Listen to the word of God. So says the Lord God, because your nakedness has been poured out and you have revealed your nakedness as you have made yourself a prostitute upon all whom you have loved and upon all the disgusting abominations like the blood and the blood of your, your children you've given to them. Last, last plus we'll read for now. I am gathering all those whom you have loved that you have relied upon. They call all those of you I love, I'll call Asher Sanit on, on all those of you who have hated. The Kibatio Tamalayach Mitzaviv, I'm going to gather them upon you from around you. The Kletier Vatech Alehem, I will reveal your nakedness to them. The Ra'uat Kalar Vatech, and they will see all your nakedness. Okay, so that's the beginning of the punishment. I mean, Jerry, you guys okay? Who's that? Oh, he wants to do painting. Well, I guess you have to do it. 
Everything okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As I'll mute if you don't mind. Sorry. Feel free to unmute if you'd like. Um, so that was a lot. That was a lot. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you're all uh, feeling very happy and inspired. So let's try <laughs> to uh, digest this as best as we can, bit by bit. So try, let, let's, let's take these to Kim. I want you to focus, you know, I just thought I would read Lamed Vav and Lamed Zion simply to show you, you know, where this is going, but I'd like to focus really from where we started and Ted Zion to Lamed Hay. So let's ask a very basic question. What stands out to you about it? What moves you? What shakes you? I mean, obviously it's pretty repulsive. It's not, you know, if uh, someone was trying out to be a rabbi somewhere and they got up there and gave a speech <laughs> like this, I don't think they'd get it. I don't know that he'd get the job. <laughs> I don't think they'd get it, no. Um, but obviously, you know, it's a message that's meant to move the reader. It's very graphic, but it's very emotional. So what do you, what, what stands out to you? What, what do you think we need to reflect on? Yes, yeah, Sherry. So... I think it's very effective because when we in our generation try to think about the taiva for a bodhisattva, it kind of it leaves us cold. We're not, right. It's not something we can identify with, and it's something that was taken away from us. But it was right. such a powerful taiva for earlier generations, and I think that going with the idea that the Torah speaks in the language of people that right. how do they convey the seriousness and the and the abhorrence to Hashem of Avodah Zorah, we needed mm -hmm. to go nuclear. And I feel like the Navi is going nuclear with giving us an allegory that will always retain its power in terms of really being like repulsive to us. Yeah. And that sense of repulsion and betrayal and the degradation of the of the woman of B'nai Yisrael, that what she's doing to herself, right? And I think that it's it works because otherwise it's very hard for me to really think about Avodah Zara in a meaningful way. It's just it's too abstract. Right. right it's too right, abstract right. for me. Right. 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 Okay. I like that. Okay. So it makes it less abstract. It, it's a very effective way of depicting the degradation. I, I definitely agree with all those. What else? What else stands out to you as you read it? I know Esther had a lot of things to say before. Go for it, Esther. I want to hear from Dorothy. Uh, in, in Pasuk Tet Vav, what really struck me was the of al kol over lo yehi. When on everybody who passed by, but the word over really brought to mind to me. Bar it brought to me mind to me Ivri that the abomination is not just what she is doing with, in this um, mashal, but that she's bringing other people into sin who are Jews. Um, and, and that's what struck me, that what is she, that she's causing other people to sin along with herself. Now, that's just the thought that came to me because of the word of, you know, the, everybody passing by. It, it, it's not just uh, people Amen. outside of the, uh, people outside of the Jews, but that she would bring the over, it just struck me over as Ivri. And it's supposed okay, nice. to be that it's supposed to rep we're supposed to have better values than that. Right. That we well, are supposed I, to be on the other side. On the point of Lo Yahi, and I'm not, you know, I think this is interesting. You you sort of have this progression. I want to sort of embellish upon this progression in a little bit, but you have in Pasuk Ted Vav, you end with Lo Yahi with a Vav. Yeah. Which means it will be for him. You'll be you that you would make yourself available to anyone who passed by. And then you have in Ted Zion, Velo Yehiyah, and it will not be. And um, um, there are different ways of translating that, but one way is translating it the way the Aramaic translation translated is no, such a thing should never be, such a thing should never have happened. It's so inappropriate. But then, if you suit him later, in in uh, um, one second here, I, I, I'm trying to find out where I saw this. You have that it actually happens. Listen, meaning it says, I can't find it right now. Um, 
I, I, all right, one second. Um, it says, you had that it was. I'm just trying to find out. I'm having trouble finding it right now. By Yehi, yeah. And Pasuk yet test, it says, after it says, all the things I gave you, the food I gave you, you gave it to, to these people that you're straying with. Then it says, and it was. So it's almost that little bit with playing with that word, lo yihi, and um, lo, yihi, lo yihi, yeah, and then by yehi, it's almost like, to me, the way I'm interpreting it, that progression is all, it's almost like, you know, that, like when things are going badly, there are certain things that you just think will never, ever happen. Like that would never happen. It can never get that bad. They never do that. that. That'd be just too much. And then it did. And then it actually happened. I okay, thank you, Esther. I just want to get to Dorothy. She wanted to say. Well, just one uh, apropos of what you're just saying, You just brought in God, God. This is against God. Haya Hovevi I mean, maybe. It's just interesting. It's just it's interesting. interesting. It's I don't know what Haya. Okay, nice. Dorothy, do you want to say? I, I wanted to say it's very graphic, and I understand that they yeah. mean Israel, but they're only talking about the woman. Well, that's the mushal, yeah. It's supposed to be, of course, all the, all of the Jews. 100%. And the Israel are depicted as this beautiful woman. That's yeah. sort of the mushal, right? So it's going to be from the female perspective. Um, and I think part of that, I want to, let me talk about this for a few minutes now. Part of that is because Again, for better or worse, and I wouldn't judge things by our modern conceptions, but I think part of the part of the uh, goal here is to pick the pick the beauty of Israel that was, and how that beauty was so horrifically tarnished and degraded and ruined. And so, in the Navi's conception, when depicting that beauty. In a very graphic and vibrant, like alive way from a birth, right? Like it's alive. The like Knesset Yisrael is alive. The best way to do that is through the image of this beautiful woman. Beautiful. Um, so that, I think that's why the focus on the feminine here, and it certainly is a huge focus. There's no doubt about it. Um, but but I hear it is it is sort of. But, the, but let me let's talk about this for a second. Right? I think the clear. The clear mashal that's obviously repeated again and again is this comparison of avodah zara to idolatry, or idolatry. No, that doesn't make sense. Idolatry to adultery or to prostitution, prostitution. That by serving all, and that's clearly what this most of this refers to. The I would say progression in which the Jewish people began to at first veer from Torah mitzvot, then serve other gods in addition to serving Hashem, do it in private, then do it publicly, then do it in various forms and more despicable forms and gruesome forms. And that, that, that spiritual degradation and that, Lust for Avodah Zara, as Shari was describing before, mm -hmm. is compared in this way to prostitution. Um, on a simple level, and but I, I but I think that the, the, the Navi wants us to really reflect upon this in a real moving way, as Shari was describing. On a simple level, you could say, well, the reason for that is that a a person who resorts to such activity and listen unfortunately we have to we acknowledge that we live in a world where such activity is becoming more common and less sort of you know above and beyond the pale and i think on a very basic level like clearly this notion that such a thing is acceptable and like if both sides are willing what's wrong with it the Navi does not at all, you know, think in such terms. It sees such activity as totally despicable. But that being said, um, that 
you could see this in just a simple level that listen, someone who engages in such activity is unfaithful. And in the same way, someone who worships another God is also being unfaithful, right? But I think it's deeper than that. And I think one way to depict this is, and I saw this, this is a well-known, and it, I, I saw it re- mentioned the Rikanadi, one of the uh, Kabbalistic commentaries on the Torah, and also in Akira Yitzchak. But it's well-known that we have 10 commandments. We have two luchot, and generally we assume there's five dibrot on each of these two tablets. And many, and Chazal already do it, they draw parallels between each the first of each set of five and the second of each set of five and the third of each set of five. So that one is parallel to six, right? So in a sense, Ani Hashem Lokechem, right? Anochi Hashem Lokecha is the mandate to have a Muna in Hashem. And Lo Tirtzach means don't kill. So Rabbi David Foreman actually explained this one. So how would you kill God? You can't kill God, obviously. But what you could do is not believe in him and deny his presence in the world. And in a sense, you're removing him from your life. So the second of that is, the second of the Dibro is lo yelecha, alokim achirim alpanai, is not to have additional gods, meaning even if you do believe in God, not to serve any other deity or other force or other spiritual entity. And the second of, the second set of Dibro is lo chinaf not to commit adultery. And by the way, although it also represents all forms of sexual relationships which the Torah forbids, so it's not just adultery, it's incest, it's all the other great stuff that we don't need to go into depth about. But um, but to N- Neof, in its basic translation refers specifically to adultery. It refers to a woman who lives with another man while she is married. And I think the reason that that is specified is because it's about infidelity and it's about forsaking the sanctity of an intimate relationship. Right? So... Niof or zinut is the word we constantly see here means that a husband and wife have a, a unique relationship. They have pleasure lives to one another and they live, they're, they're meant to live that life with sanctity and they have this beauty and they're supposed to essentially commit that expression of beauty and physicality to one another. And when a person, due to zinut, due to some sort of temptation, um, breaks that relationship and, um, and shares that part of their life, that sensuality with another person, so they're violating the intimacy of their relationship, right? They're, they're, they've tarnished it. They tarnish that beauty, that secrecy, that uniqueness. And now you can look at this very <coughs> intense part of a person's life, which should have been sanctified and beautiful and wonderful. And the truth is now, you can question all of their, you know, um, sensuality because if a person's willing to do this and they're willing to act out on their urges and just to do this with anybody or somebody else, so then what does that really say about the way they view their beauty, etc.? And I think the main point of this parak is to say that that same. I think we all have a certain natural. Um, I hope at least, I would say, I hope we all have a certain natural revulsion or disgust with such behavior that we look at someone who doesn't and we say like, how could you do such a thing? Like, this is wrong. This is vile. You're taking something so beautiful and wonderful 
and you're totally degrading it and contaminating it. And it's almost like, like uh, you hear about that, you're like, oh, like it hurts. Like you're, it's revolting. It's disgusting. And Hashem is saying that in his view, and that part of the whole point of this parak is this point, that he looks at his relationship with Kla Yisrael in the same way, with the same sanctity, the same care, the same pledge of loyalty, um, and the same intimacy as a husband would and a wife would with their spouse. And when the Jewish people cheat and leave that relationship, that he has the same exact disgust. And particularly, given that it's not just a normal relationship, but it's one in which Hashem is saying that I took you from nothing when you were sort of rejected and forsaken and alone. And I took you up and I raised you and all the beauty that you had was simply my gift to you. And all I wanted you to do is to, to use that gift in the appropriate way. And now you're using it, not only in the inappropriate way, but to forsake that relationship and to be unloyal and to display this sort of infidelity. That's just so disgusting. That's a toeva, that's abominable. Um, and the grat the and as I again I think Sherry said before, I think it's so graphic and it's really graphic here, like very, very vivid imagery and repeating like all sorts of horrific things that this woman is accused of doing. I think it's supposed to really move you and say, wow, this was awful. This is horrible. Like, how could they have done this? This was just such a betrayal, a disgusting betrayal of an intimate relationship. The Jews are supposed to have this intimate relationship with God and look what they've done to forsake that relationship. I think that's the overall message of this um, part of the Navi. If you look a little bit carefully, and, and this is the Malbim's idea, back to the sort of the Jewish, you know, the portrayal of Jewish history until this point, I think you also see that there are stages to this. It doesn't all happen at once. Um, so, for instance, if you look at Pasuk Tetzayin, and again, I apologize for how graphic this is, but we are reading the Navi here. So, we start off, you took your clothing, and it's important to remember that all these terms, the Bigodin, the Zahav, the Keseh, the Solet, the Shemen, all these were terms that the Navi had used in, hash, in describing how this man had taken this young girl and adorned her and given her all this sort of stuff. And those same things, those same gifts that he had given to her, now she is using for her prostitution, right? So it begins, she takes the clothing and it's sort of the outer layer of clothing and she makes these colorful sort of hills. And then she takes her glorious utensils and she makes Salme Zahar. I'm not going to go into the translation of that again, but here's the thing. Okay. Where is all that happening? If you think about a person in their life and you think about this woman, an actual woman is doing this. The Malba makes the claim that this is all happening in the privacy of her home. It's Salme Zahar, right? It's some sort of image that arouses her. It's some sort of hills of clothing. Again, I'm not exactly sure what the hills of clothing are meant to function, how they're meant to function in terms of the description of prostitution. But the Malbim suggests that this is all being done in private. You have these little hills and these images uh, meant to arouse this person. And she's and she's uh, enjoying them in the privacy of her home. Yeah. And that, that says um, Malbim, is reflective of the first stages of this. Maybe slightly after the reign of Shlomo and David Amelech, the Jews begin to privately engage in idolatrous practices or this sort of black magic. In fact, 
Malbim says that it refers to not literal worshiping of another god, but some sort of um, almost sorcery whereby you take some sort of image or statue and you, you know, you pray to it in the belief that spiritual energy will be transferred from on high into the statue and it will sort of enhance your relationship with God. It will make you give you these powers of some sort. So it's not direct idolatry and it's in private. And then we go on and it clearly becomes more public, right? Um, then there's it goes on to actual idolatry and, and sacrificial service, right? And that's the description of the solet and shemen, the oil and flour and the devash, and putting it in front of them, that's karbonos. And you took the karbonot that I gave you to serve me in the mikdash, and now you're giving karbonot to another god in, 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 in forsaking that unique relationship. Um, and then we have a really troubling description of the children, the children that are offered. So there are different ways of looking at this. Chazal see this potentially, in Rashi quotes this in Pesach Chaf, that it's the idea of not necessarily literally sacrificing children, but it's about committing them to Avodah Zarah. So giving them over to the temple or the church, if you will, saying, you know, the way Arashi quotes Chazal, like as follows. First, he says a person had five children. Four of them would be designated to serve idolatry and whatever, I guess, like a church boy or something like that, like dedicated to those temples. And the fifth one would be uh, set aside for Limutot. So sort of like, you know, division of labor, if in a very twisted way. And then, however, there's also another way of looking at this is literal child sacrifice. So for instance, we know of Molech. Molech is one of the forms of Avodah Zarah described in the Torah and in Navi as well. And the way it was served, and it's a bit of a dispute how exactly this works, but it involved running children through fire. And involve literal child sacrifice. And Chazal say that fifth child who was pledged for Avodah for Lima Torah, that's the one that they would then give to the priests for the child sacrifice, right? Very uh, scary image. So it gets worse and worse. And then um, you have public displays of idolatry, right? That's in a Chafdale and a Chafhe. And uh, further on, and maybe this is further on in their history, um, they're building, they're building mounds and altars on every hilltop, at every street, at every road. So now there's no longer that shame or the, the, the feeling of the need to worship privately, but now it's in public. Now, you can find them out in the open um, until finally it gets worse and worse. And they just continue to um, take on the deities of the nations around them, all the different forms of pagan sacrifice and pagan worship. So it's Ashur. And these are, by the way, nations that. Well, some of whom were their allies and some of whom were not their allies. So Mitzrayim, um, the Jews looked to Mitzrayim for support at various points in Jewish history. They were chastised for doing that, which, by the way, might be another layer to this sort of adultery in the sense that they, instead of relying on their relationship with God for their security and well-being, they refused to be faithful to Torah and mitzvot and instead said, we'll take confidence in making a treaty with foreign nations like the Mitzrim and like other nations, and that will be our protection. So instead of relying on God, relying on these foreign nations, that's also a form of infidelity. But on a more basic level, 
the Navi is clearly saying they they take on the idolatry of Egypt and Ashur. Well, Ashur is the nation that caused the exile of the ten tribes, and so you know clearly this the, the message here is that you doing this. Um, um, did not help you, and in fact, it ensured your downfall. And then Kasdim, right? The Babylonians are their current oppressors who are ultimately going to destroy the base of Mikdash, brought many of them already into exile, but instead of rejecting them, they took on their idolatry. And it just goes on and on. And maybe the most disgusting um way in which they're depicted here that the Bnei Israel is depicted is it's not just that you were like a zona but a zona at least gets something in return mm. meaning they take well look i got paid <laughs> you know i i made a, i made my living and hashem is saying to jewish people you're not getting anything in return and you're giving up everything in return you're going to lose all the beauty all the prominence and the base of mikdash and kingship and being admired among the nations, you're going to lose all of that. And you're almost thirsting for this. I have Zara, you're paying for it. You're not getting paid for it. Um, so that's, again, a very brief general summary of all of this. But I think the main point that the Navi is trying to make sure we understand is that he wants the Jewish people to hear this and be totally disgusted with the way that they have behaved that it's not it's not enough to say you know oh idolatry oh that's that's quite bad that's quite bad you know it's not right not a very good thing to do naughty 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 it's more than that it's yuck gross like it it, it offends you it's like it offends your sensibilities like how could such a thing have happened this is disgusting look what we've become Look what this nation has become. We're, we're, we're as revolting as could be. Um, and it's pretty negative, but I think the Navi is saying you have to understand how bad it is before you can even begin to think of returning. But if we can end in a positive note, the reason, and, and many of us should talk about this, Ramban also, is that the reason Hashem gets so upset about this is because of the reverence and love and the value he attributes to his relationship with the Jewish people. It's because of that relationship, because of that closeness and preciousness that when the Jewish people stray, you have this description and all the offense taken. So... <laughs> it's us to, to, to really see this relationship that we have with the Shem in a real, meaningful way, living way, so that a our incentive to do the right thing is <laughs> do the right thing is because oh. we value that relationship so much, and we would never dare forsake it. So I'll pause here for now. Thank you very much for joining us this week.